In this section, I will discuss further the principles of benzodiazepine tapering. Before you begin a taper or deprescribing with a patient, you want to ensure that you both understand that the goals for a successful taper are to decrease withdrawal effects and manage rebound symptoms, as well as recurrence of any underlying symptoms that were being managed by the benzodiazepine. Before you begin a taper, you want to engage in an ongoing shared decision-making about the deprescribing plan and establish a flexible gradual taper plan. I tend to try to stick to laying out maybe two steps at a time and waiting to see after initial one or two reductions how a patient does before we kind of come up with the next few steps. It's also extremely important to discuss other lifestyle modifications that patients should engage in to help manage their overall mental health and their withdrawal symptoms. So reviewing with them what their current diet is, how many fruits and vegetable servings are they getting per day? Do they get regular meals throughout the day? What their physical activity routine is and how to improve that even if, you know, it's just increasing taking some short walks between breaks at work and getting out and getting some sunshine, reviewing their sleep hygiene and potential cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia interventions to help with their sleep and providing other skills for coping with distress, such as meditation, mindfulness, and stress reduction. Also really important that patients establish a support system around them with a multidisciplinary approach. So engaging their mental health providers, their primary care providers, family members, friends, so that they have a wide range of individuals that are aware of what they're embarking on and are there to offer different types of support. Would encourage you to look at the peer support guidance document also on the Benzodiazepine Action workgroup page, benzoaction.org, under projects to provide some other examples of ways that our patients can seek support during this process. Overall, the goal in deprescribing should be to maintain the patient's function as much as possible so that they're able to continue to do the things they need and want to do and minimize their distress so they don't feel too out of control or bothered by the withdrawal. Additionally, before engaging in a taper, we want to stabilize any inner dose withdrawal by either dosing a shorter half-life benzodiazepine more frequently and or cross-tapering to an equivalent dose of a longer half-life benzodiazepine. So I ask them to keep a diary of when and how you're taking your benzodiazepine. This helps me get an idea whether they are able to still take it very consistently or whether there's great fluctuation and they're taking it here and there because they're responding to experiencing interdose withdrawal symptoms or increased anxiety. If it seems that they're taking it more erratically because of existing withdrawal symptoms, I will first try to stabilize their withdrawal symptoms by having them dose the medication more frequently to try to avoid them having those peaks and troughs in their blood levels. This can mean for super short-acting benzodiazepine like alprazolam, having them take it up to four, maybe even five times a day. For lorazepam, also maybe anywhere from three to five times a day. Clonazepam, usually more like two or three, but have seen it four. And diazepam is interesting because while it could be once daily to help with some withdrawal effects, the anxiolytic effect is much shorter lived. So I do find that individuals often benefit from taking it at least three times a day, sometimes even four. If they don't tolerate or aren't interested in trying to take what they're currently taking more frequently, then the other approach is to cross taper them to a, a equivalent dose of a longer half-life benzodiazepine. The one most frequently used is diazepam, and that's the one that Heather Ashton really supports in her manual. When that's not an option or a patient is not willing or able to take that, you can look at some of the other longer acting like chlorodiazepoxide or chlorazepate. A reminder that when you're cross-tapering to equivalent dose of a longer half-life, 
benzodiazepine, you should always engage in a stepwise crossover, which is what is utilized in the Ashton method. The reason to do this, to not just substitute complete dose of one shorter acting benzodiazepine for a longer acting, is that it's going to take longer for the longer acting to build up to steady state. And if you completely replace it from the short acting, initially patients could end up with withdrawal symptoms in the days between the longer acting reaching steady state. When engaging in deep prescribing, including when cross tapering to longer acting, it's important that you have a good understanding of the formulations that the different benzodiazepines come in. And so this table just kind of outlines overall in the United States, the tablet sizes that the different medications come in, the approximate equivalent to 10 milligrams of diazepam. What you'll know is the more potent benzodiazepines such as alprazolam, lorazepam, clonazepam, you're somewhat limited in the doses that they come in and can see that equivalently it's still a significant amount of diazepam. You'll also see there's a dose range for many of them, and this is because there's not a perfect cross tolerance between everyone. When thinking about overall approaches to tapering, recommend engaging a patient in an initial test reduction of the smallest possible dose you can do based on the formulation they have. So for most patients, if they get a good tablet cutter, they could cut their tablet in quarters, certainly getting them the smallest tablet available is useful. For clonazepam, it does have an oral disintegrating tablet that comes in a 0.25 and a 0.125. Some people find these easier to work with than others. Some find them a little too crumbly, depending on the insurance, depends on how expensive they are to obtain, although you can also look for coupons to help decrease the out-of-pocket cost. We always recommend doing a test reduction because it will really give you a sense and the patient a sense of how sensitive they may be to this tapering process and whether they may benefit from a slower taper or they might tolerate even initially larger dose reductions. As I tell the residents I supervise, you know, the risk of going too quickly, say doing a 25% reduction initially, is that if the patient has a bad experience, you potentially lose their buy-in to the process and they become leery of continuing to taper because this initial dose reduction made them feel so awful or out of control. And they also lose their confidence that this is something they can do. When possible, it's best to try to avoid skipping doses, also providing like rescue doses. And when at all possible, you want to avoid going back up on a dose when you've decreased it. Certainly there are circumstances where you'll decide the benefit of increasing the dose back up is greater than the risks because they're having severe side effects. But again, all of this can be minimized by doing an initial smaller dose reduction. Some reasons you might re-increase the dose would be if they're experiencing severe akathisia or significant suicidal ideation. When approaching tapering in general, you want to always be thinking about the percent reduction from the last dose. As a result, it means that as you go down, the dose reduction should become smaller in amount in order to try to maintain about the same percentage reduction. So for example, if you have one milligram and you decrease by 10%, 0.1, you're going to 0.9. Well, the next time decreasing from 0.9, the reduction is going to be 0.09 instead of 0.1. So for many patients, you can engage in a gradual taper over several months, maybe three to six months. For others, if they find that they're having more symptoms, it may need to be a more gradual process of 12 to 18 months. Some folks, it's even two years. So I think really thinking of it as a marathon and not a sprint with your patient and that each dose reduction you're able to do is helping them decrease the long-term risks of continuing on these medications. Would encourage everyone to have urine drug testing be part of their taper process when it's available. I always tell patients the point is not to catch them. The point is to make sure we have a complete picture of everything that they are using. 
so that we can minimize their risks and know what else may be contributing to their symptoms. If urine drug testing is not possible, would still make sure that you're utilizing the prescription drug monitoring program so that you're aware of any other controlled substances that are prescribed, including other benzodiazepine prescriptions they may have gotten recently or in the past. And make sure you have a discussion with the patient that this is also an additional tool you are using in your care of them. So overall, the key points for this section is that our goal of tapering patients off of benzodiazepine is to control the rate of the taper in order to minimize their withdrawal effects and manage rebound of any symptoms. Before we begin a dose reduction, we want to stabilize any inner dose withdrawal by either dosing a shorter half-life benzodiazepine more frequently and or cross-tapering to an equivalent dose of a longer half-life benzodiazepine. And finally, reminder, when making dose reductions, think in percent reduction from the current dose, dose reductions should become smaller as the taper progresses. 